we're going to take a kind of whistle stop tour through uh, the, the fruits of science, parapsychology, ethnobotany, psychopharmacology, and the what we could call the foamy custard of folklore, anthropology, mythology, cultural studies, and related disciplines. Um, <laughs> hopefully, it won't be a trifle too interdisciplinary. <laughs> Out. Okay. Um, I'm a parapsychologist by training, so uh, although this conference isn't supposed to be about ontology as such, I'm, I consider myself an ontologist, so I'm going to kind of talk about that. And I'm going to pick up the baton um, where Jack kind of uh, left off in many ways with the, the early psychical researches began uh, grappling with it in the, the late 19th century, and pretty much picking up where Ronald Hutton left off as well, um, very admirably and very eloquently yesterday. Uh, and despite what he says, I do actually believe he probably did kiss the lamb and sheep because he seems to be particularly poetic in his delivery. Um, but he's keeping that one quiet. Uh, so it kind of pretty much starts with the anthropologist and also psychical researcher Andrew Lang, who was president of the, uh, the SPR for, for some time. And uh, he looked through all the kind of accounts of elves from different cultures and fairies as well from across the globe, from Australia to uh, his native Scotland, but refused to actually believe they existed uh, in and of themselves, uh, but associated them rather with phantasms of the dead, particularly with um, poltergeist phenomena. Uh, the other side of the century, uh, Evans Wentz uh, was next to do the dance around the fairy ring, pretty much, and uh, he published this massive study on uh, fairy faith in Celtic countries, Exactly 100 years ago, actually, it came out in, in 1911, so we can kind of celebrate the centenary of that. And he documented oral histories from across the British Isles and Brittany. And uh, the traditional for informants was to align the elves with spirits of the dead themselves. Uh, but Evans Wentz concluded that they were actually real but fourth dimensional beings, um, most likely connected to, to spirits of the dead. And by fourth dimensional beings, he took this idea of uh, you know, the kind of flat land, and uh, if we lived in a two-dimensional world, we wouldn't be able to perceive into the third dimension. He says the same thing goes for uh, kind of fairyland, it exists in a kind of fourth spatial dimension that we're, we're not kind of usually aware of. In fact, he said, fairyland exists as a supernormal, uh, <clears throat> supernormal state of consciousness which men and women may enter temporarily in dreams, trances, or in various ecstatic conditions, or for an indefinite period at death, which is a kind of permanent ecstatic uh, condition. Um, so this kind of brings up two things here, that, that the importance of all states of consciousness uh, in, in accessing fairyland, but also that fairyland is an intermediate place that souls of the dead pass through. Um, okay, zooping a bit further forward in time and the kind of following decades, uh, we have the, 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 the notion of UFOs start becoming quite prevalent in the, in the cultural record. By 1947, uh, in a poll, 87% of the, the population had heard of UFOs, and it quickly developed its own cultural cosmology. Um, for instance, within four weeks of a 1954 news report of flying saucers, uh, the, an opinion found, poll found that 17% of people had now believed in them. Um, by the 1960s, the UFO and uh, alien abduction phenomena was becoming quite rampant in, in many ways. Uh, it's led Jacques Vallée to uh, draw uh, persisting parallels between aliens and elves, who was the first to say that the, kind of, the elves themselves are kind of uh, uh, technologised communities of fairies for the, for the 20th century. Sorry, aliens themselves are a technologised community of, of fairies for the 20th century. Uh, and looked at the kind of similarities between them, the very small, uh, these big black eyes, um, and of course the abduction activity. Um, reports of alien abduction encounters uh, increased over the years as well, uh, popularised by uh, writers like uh, Whitley Strider. Uh, Strider was credited with popularising uh, odd new developments on the aliens as well, such as encounters with uh, insectoid-like aliens, praying mantises in particular, but also uh, the classic kind of small grey, elephant-like aliens, uh, albeit with very cartoon-like uh, appearances. Um, this may uh, have not been very funny for Stryker at the time, but it was something which made it, it, it became a, a kind of a, a laughing point for his critics in many ways. Um, 
But this wasn't so funny in light of other developments at that time. In the 1960s, we have the, uh, the introduction of uh, psychedelics on, onto the kind of cultural scene. Uh, and I'm going to particularly focus on one of those psychedelic substances, and that is uh, DMT. Maybe we should use some slides here. Okay, that's a kind of chemical <coughs> structure of DMT. <coughs> a neat and simple molecule. I'll give you some kind of background on that before I continue with the, the insectoid stories of aliens. Um, so DMT is a naturally occurring compound. It's found in uh, many plants. It's extracted from plants, it can be. But it's also found in a lot of animals, uh, particularly mammals and humans as well, of course. We all kind of have DMT in us, and it's found in the brain tissue and in the blood. Um, so we find it naturally occurring in people's brains. It's also a kind of highly uh, psychedelic substance. Um, if you were to take DMT, it's, it's kind of very intense, uh, short-acting. Uh, the best way to actually ingest it, because you can't actually eat it, it's denatured in your stomach by certain enzymes. If you were to smoke DMT, uh, that's one of the best ways to get it directly. You have a very short-lived, intense, 10-minute experience, um, which pretty much starts by the time you exhale your, your first uh, inhalation. Uh, so assuming, of, of course, you, uh, you exhale. Uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a Scottish MEP, so it was kind of challenged to Clinton's, oh, I never inhaled. Uh, he said, have you ever tried cannabis? And he says, yes, but I never exhaled. <laughs> <laughs> got him, got him <laughs> um, anyway, a little diversion there. So it's, it's very intense, very short acting. Uh, and, and a great article in the 1990s uh, uh, called Apparent uh, Communication with Discarnate Entities Induced by DMT, uh, a character called Mayer, um, gives some kind of accounts of, of, the, of the experiences that people go through. And he says there's a kind of number of different levels of experience depending on, on the depth of experience you go to. It starts off level one, threshold experience, uh, interior flowing of energy and consciousness. And level two becomes vivid, brightly coloured geometric visual patterns. Uh, the geometries are basically two dimensional, but they may pulse. Uh, the transitional phase that follows that, there's a tunnel or breakthrough experience and passage through to an entrance into another world. Uh, at level three, once you've gone through the passageway, there are three or higher dimensional space, so uh, kind of going back to Evans Wentz's idea of this hyper, hyperspace, and possible contact with entities, a sense of being in an objective space, and of meeting intelligent and communicating entities. So, repeated that. And then finally, after that is the white light. So to give you some examples of that uh, classic experiences, there's a paper from uh, Timothy Leary actually written in, in 1966 <coughs> called Programmed Communication with, uh, du During Experiences with DMT. And uh, he gives an account of uh, Alan Watts, the, the famous kind of Zen philosopher, who was, who was also very well known for talking a lot. And uh, he apparently never shut up, so and Timothy Leary suggested no matter what psychedelic substances he gave to him, he'd just carry on talking. He, he discovered DMT and he gave Watts DMT and Watts was telling a story and then he kind of took the pipe and it actually worked, you know, he shut up for 10 minutes. Uh, but when he emerged, he then carried on telling the story where he'd left off. <laughs> nothing had happened without missing a beat. Um, but he did describe his experience and he says it was exceedingly uh, difficult. And uh, he said it was like... Uh, attempting to give a moment-to-moment -moment descriptions of one's reactions while being fired out of the muzzle of an atomic cannon with neon Byzantine barreling. So, uh, uh, pretty intense experience, you could say. Um, moving on to the kind of the next level then, beyond the actual pure uh, geometries, we go into the kind of uh, the encounter with entities. And one of the first researchers of DMT, in fact, uh, the person who discovered its psychedelic properties. It had been synthesized about 20 years earlier, but in 1957, a Hungarian uh, psychopharmacologist called Zara um, experimented with DMT on himself and had some kind of extraordinary experiences. And then he started giving it to his medical colleagues and uh, they reported all kinds of strange things. One of them said, the whole room is filled with spirits. Another one said, 
I feel exactly as if I were flying. Uh, in front of me are two quiet, sunlit gods. So um, encounters with entities are kind of one of the kind of most common features of DMT at a kind of certain dosage. Uh, and in fact, you know, some of uh, DMT experience in certain research that has suggested at a certain dosage you, you can no longer be an atheist uh, because you kind of have these kind of uh, encounter experiences. It is now, of course, uh, a uh, scheduled substance, so research with it has been kind of pretty much curtailed. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, the 1990s that Rick Strassman started reviving the research into DMT. Um, because throughout you know, the late 70s it became scheduled, it became a, a class A drug in this country, which is kind of proof in the pudding that the, uh, the law on drugs is a complete mess pretty much because we all have DMT in our brains, so you know, every one of us is completely illegal and can serve a lifetime imprisonment for the manufacture of DMT, the penalty is. Uh, so we should all kind of march down to the police station and hand ourselves in, if we're good citizens, of course. <coughs> That's another story. Um, Deliri, before it became illegal, actually, kind of a, in his, uh, his programmed communication during experiences with DMT, he developed a technique which he called the experiential typewriter. Uh, it was very simple, really. He basically, you know, you, you have the, the substance, you go into the experience, you're allowed to kind of submerge yourself into the experience completely, but then every two minutes, uh, you'd have a sitter with you who'd say, where are you now? And then you quickly kind of report on your kind of, kind of uh, phenomenological state, your kind of state of consciousness. So here's a, a Tim's experience with DMT. Minute two, Tim, where are you now? <laughs> Ralph's voice, stately, kind. What? Where? You? Open eyes. There, squatting next to me, are two magnificent insects, skin burnished. <laughs> Glowing metallic with hammered jewels inlaid, richly costumed, they looked at me sweetly, dear radiant Venusian crickets. One has a pad in his lap. This is one of those kind of new uh, iPads. And, so <laughs> and is holding out a gem encrusted box with undulating trapezoidal glowing sections. Questioning look, incredible. And next to him, Mrs. Diamond Cricket softly slides into a lattice work of vibrations. Dr. Ruby Emerald Cricket smiles. Tim, where are you now? <laughs> comes back to reality. So that was Tim's experience with these kind of insectoid-like entities under the influence of DMT on his uh, very first uh, <coughs> journey. Um, as I said, though, it was kind of uh, criminalised in, in the 1970s, in 1971, I believe. And uh, so research was curtailed with it, but. In the 1990s, a, a kind of brave researcher by the name of Rick Strassman um, started conducting research with it. He set up a medical program and uh, he had uh, 60 volunteers um, go through the program and were given, he administered 400 doses of DMT by injection. You can actually inject it in a kind of fumarate form. And uh, one of the significant experiences that people reported in, in that research was encounters with entities, what they called either entities, beings, guides, or helpers, usually, although they weren't always very helpful. Um, the entities, and entities themselves would often appear as clowns, reptiles, mantises, for some reason praying mantises were quite common, bees, spiders, cacti, or stick insects. Um, but they may also appear as, as we would expect, dwarves, elves, imps, or even angels, spirits, gods, or sometimes just a presence. And that presence was usually supremely powerful, loving, and wise, thankfully. Um, however, all the, not all the experiences were particularly pleasant. Uh, one of his uh, TMT participants was kind of anally raped by a reptile um, and had kind of, kind of tra traumatic experience. Um, so they weren't all kind of, kind of loving and wise. 